What the... Did I just hear? JP Morgan thinks markets could retest October 2022 lows. Are we about to get rug pulled tomorrow from the Fed? Is that why the Nasdaq dropped 2% today? We're going to roll this clip from JP Morgan and get you guys caught up to speed on everything you need to know for tomorrow. I guess the S&P 500 is tracking for its worst month of the year. Join us now with a look at a technical look at the markets. Jason Hunter, JP Morgan's head of global fixed income and U.S. Uh, equity technical strategy. How much of the was there any um, too much optimism built up going from the October lows to where we were in June and July? Jason, did that need to be worked off? And has it happened? Well, yeah, we originally thought 4,200 would be a ceiling for the S&P, and that was the case uh, for the better part of the first half of the year, up until the economic data started to beat expectations, of, let's call it from May through August. And what you saw was a position squeeze. People actually got quite pessimistic and, and uh, underpositioned uh, by the time you got into early May. And that 400-point squeeze, you know, I think did make things a bit too optimistic. You didn't see sentiment measures really get uh, into the nosebleed section, but things got fairly optimistic for where we are within a late cycle environment. Um, and we think now the tide is turning. You know, So we stepped off of our bearish view with the move above 4,200, but as the market started to roll over again from channel resistance at 4,600, some of our technical signals started to trigger at that point, pattern-based signals. Um, so we are bearish going into the, uh, the fall period now. Yeah, you are. Okay. And I was wondering what other um, technical bells are, are ringing. I saw the NASDAQ breath was like the worst in history or something. Are there 50-day moving averages that are being breached? What, what other things are telling you uh, that, that are notable <clears throat> that you don't see all the time that might indicate a trend? Well, I, I mean, if we take a big step back and we look at some of the, the broader cross-market signals, the yield curve has been inverted uh, for the better part of a year and a half now. Um, historically, if you go back to the early 1970s and look at the timing of these cycles, um, generally between 19 and 24 months after the curve inverts, you see your cycle peak in equity markets that then transition into an economic contraction. As we go into the fourth quarter, uh, you're about to roll into that window of time from the yield curve inverting, you know, the, the, the time ago that it did. Uh, on top of that, from a, a, just a, a yearly cyclical perspective, you look at seasonality. Um, you know, it's well known September and early October are not a good time to be in risky markets. Um, so we put that together with the high frequency pattern signaling that we talked about already from 4600. Hey, Jason. It, yeah. So if all of this is the case, does that mean you should just be out of the market through through the end of the year? Um, at the very least for right now, yes, the pendulum looks like it's going to swing back in, in the really? bearish direction. So you'd sell or you'd just sell not buy? Or just not, that's what we're trying to figure out. You'd sell, not buy. You'd buy defensive stuff. What would you be doing? So given where we are in the cycle, um, you know, I'm on, I'm on the, of the view that you should be underweight and, and even short if you're a leveraged investor or trader right now. Um, until we see signs of, of a bottom, if the market does pull back like we think, now that could be 4,200, that could be 3,800, it could be a retest of the lows at, at, at 3,500. Until we see signs of that bottom, um, I would stay out of the market and, and in the defensive posture right now. So let me summarize that. JP Morgan said you should get out of the markets and that the markets could fall another 20 to 21% from here. That would be the drop to get back to the October lows. Now, a drop back to 3,800, as he said, would be a fall of about 13% from here. A drop to 420 looks a lot more reasonable. That would be a fall of about 3.67% from the close of today. I mean, that's actually crazy to hear after everyone has been so bullish since May. And really what started the bullishness in May was NVIDIA earnings. NVIDIA just had earnings yesterday, and they were very good again, another blowout quarter. But what happened? The S&P 500 dropped 1.4%, and the NASDAQ lost over 2%. This is a problem. Tomorrow's catalyst is going to come early in the trading day tomorrow. It's the speech from Fed Jerome Powell at the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. The last time this speech happened was back here in mid-August. And what happened? The markets fell 19.5% from mid-August to the beginning of October. Now, I know what some of you guys might be thinking. 
Isn't this a Tesla channel? Why are we talking about Jackson Hole and Fed Jerome Powell and what could happen to the markets? Well, hopefully you already know why. Hopefully you know that these things affect Tesla stock and your investment. Whether it's Tesla, the markets, any trades that you have, all of this will be affected by the catalyst coming tomorrow morning at 10.05 Eastern Standard Time or 7.05 Pacific Time in Fed Jerome Powell's speech. After all, if Nvidia's blowout quarter did not cause the markets to be bullish, in fact, the Nasdaq dropped almost 2.5% today and Tesla's stock dropped about 3% today, we could have a problem coming tomorrow. And Tesla tends to overdo what the markets do. If the Nasdaq is down 2%, Tesla tends to be down 3 to 4%. Now, today was actually a pretty good day considering the Nasdaq was down almost 2.5%, Tesla down close to about 3%. I would call that a good day. But simply put, boil this down to just being simple. The markets essentially crashed today before the Fed's speech, before Powell's speech. This does not look good. This does not look pretty. Much the same way as NVIDIA was getting upgrades right before earnings. And then, ooh, big shocker. There's a blowout quarter. It's not a big shocker. It won't be a big shocker if Fed Jerome Powell is hawkish tomorrow and does, as this guest on CNBC says, make the bond market go parabolic. And I think the bond market is actually what we should be watching very closely. Bond market took over as the catalyst from NVIDIA. There was nothing wrong with NVIDIA. Well, obviously. It reaffirmed the potential optimism uh, in terms of being able to come out of the earnings recession surrounding generative AI, but it's about bond yields. It's, it's bond yields here and now. And going into tomorrow's uh, Jackson Hole speech, Boy, Chairman Powell has to really walk a fine line because he could send the bond market parabolic. What Joe Terranova on CNBC means by federal Powell could make the bond market go parabolic, he means the bond yield. So 10-year Treasury yields are at 4.24%. This is looking at the longer end of the curve. This is actually a good sign relatively for the economy, meaning that 10 years down the line, the higher this yield goes, the less rate cuts the Fed will need to do. That could be skewed towards maybe there's higher inflation, so on and so forth. But due to the, the break-evens that we're seeing out there in the bond market, it doesn't look like that's what we're expecting is inflation to be really high for a long time. It's more so saying the economy is going to be strong enough to keep rates higher for longer. And this is a problem for equities. Take, for an example, the last Jackson Hole meeting that we had. Hopefully, you guys can see this very well. Well, back in June of 2022, bond yields hit a high of about 3.37% and started to fall. Bond yields fell to 2.64% by August. That's what caused the bear market bounce in August of 2022, right before Jackson Hole. What happened following Jackson Hole? Yields went from 2.64% to a high of 4.23%. Well, you're higher than the October low in the markets, the highest yield on the bond yields back in 2022. You're at 4.24%. So you're seeing the bond yields at a new high. Last time they were this high, the S&P was at 343. You are at... 436 today and you were as high as 460 so you have not seen the same pattern play out that you seen back in june of 2022 again where bond yields started to fall and you caused this bear market bounce and then subsequently rates started to rise and you caused this 20 percent sell-off or so this whole time pretty much bond yields have been slowly rising. If the Fed does cause bond yields to rise aggressively, you're going to have a major problem for the land of equities, 
for stocks. The bond market is three to five times larger than the stock market. Believe that. So it, when bond yields rise, it pulls capital out of markets. It makes the lending environment a lot more challenging. And the odds of the Fed messing up and restricting the economy too much also rises as bond yields rise. This is why specifically for Tesla, this could be a problem. If bond yields go even higher from here, well, Tesla's business is about 90% loan originated right people have to get loans to buy cars about 90 percent of the time people don't buy cars with cash so as the bond yields go higher it forces buyers out of the market so it's a less it's a smaller pool per se of buyers that are available to buy teslas and this is not just for tesla this is for any business that revolves around credit in general it's not just bad for Tesla or wouldn't be bad for Tesla. It's bad for a lot of people. But we are Tesla investors because Tesla is the greatest company in the world and will be the largest company in the world, give it enough time. But in the short term, bond yields going higher would not be good for Tesla. And historically, if we do go through an actual correction and get that 10% down move, well, Tesla usually does about two times better than the S&P or two times worse than the S&P. Obviously, it depends what's going on with the company at the time, right? There's different variables that go into it. But let's just say the S&P, like we said earlier, needs to drop about 5% from here to get to that 10% correction level. That would mean roughly a 10% fall for Tesla. That would put Tesla's stock around 207 I think that's actually pretty dang reasonable. Now, if we get bad news or good news with Tesla, obviously this could could change and vary. But if it's worse than a correction, if we were to fall another, you know, 7% in the markets, that would be a, around 15% for Tesla. That would put Tesla at 196. If we were to see a 20% pullback and if JP Morgan was actually right, and the S&P still needed to fall 15%, and let's say Tesla fell 30%, that would put Tesla back to about 160. The only way Tesla goes back to 160 is if the economy does go through a sharp downturn, in, in which we'll talk about the economic data that came out today. It doesn't look good, but still, that doesn't look likely, right? A deep recession out of nowhere does not look likely, but we'll talk about it. Or... If you see bond yields go crazy, go parabolic, and if you see price cuts, again, from Tesla, that's the only way that Tesla goes back to 160, 150. If those things don't happen, it's simply not going to happen. So I would be very careful with how bearish you are getting right now or how pessimistic you are getting on Tesla stock. You've already fallen quite a bit from where we were at at about $300 per share. And the business is doing great. It's doing just fine. And estimates are very low for 2024. So Tesla is not expensive by any means necessary. Now, when I think about this quite logically, I can also make the counter argument that most of the time when the biggest crash has come is right after everyone was bullish. What happened over the last three months? Nobody was bearish that's why the the beginning of this video i played that clip from jp morgan because it's just so off the walls compared to what we have seen and heard from analysts and investors over the last three months everyone's been bullish this is the new bull market and you're destined for new all-time highs by the end of this year that's what everyone was saying two weeks ago and now we're gonna hit the lows uh, it really makes the argument that maybe we are in for a deeper crash. But still, I would love to see Tesla stock fall to 150. Hell, even back to 100. I'm a long-term investor. And I think most of you guys are as well. That should actually be welcomed if you are a long-term investor. Because you can go buy the dip at stupidly cheap levels. Back on September 29th, 2022, right as the S&P 500 was hitting its lows, the probability 
for a recession one year out was 96% while really heading into Q4 of 2022. Everyone was bearish. And look at this chart going back to 1976. Anytime this has got over 90%, you have went into a recession shortly after that. So this is already quite strange because you hit 96% and we're not in a recession already. And it's almost one year later and we're still not in a recession. So this is already breaking historical trends and the historical norm since at least 1976. Where are the odds today of a recession by July of 2024? About one year down the line. 59%. So... People have gotten a lot less bearish recently. This could set us up again, like I said, for that larger correction and or crash. I asked ChatGPT what happens right before a recession. Number one, economic slowdown. This has to do with GDP. We're not necessarily seeing that yet, but GDP can fall rapidly if that's the direction we're going. Number two, a decline in personal spending. Consumer spending, a major driver of economic activity, may start to decline. People may become more cautious about their spending due to economic uncertainty or rising prices. What did Dollar Tree say today? Dollar Tree's share price dropped 13% as the CEO says challenging economy is pressuring the discounter. Its, uh, its shares dropped 13% as the discounter said customers are spending mostly on food and essentials. So it looks like we're already seeing the consumer slowing down. Number three, an investment downturn. Business investment may decrease as companies become more cautious about expanding or upgrading their operations. Well, what just came out yesterday? It was this. The global services flash PMI came in below expectations at 51.0 versus 52.2 that was expected what this is is basically a survey from business owners on how they are operating their business if they are seeing a slowdown or if they are expanding in their business anything under 50 is at outright contractionary but 51 is not necessarily expanding all too much as well everything has basically been falling with this survey since mid 2021 the composite output the manufacturing output as well as service business activity number four rising unemployment we haven't seen this quite yet although we have seen big movements in unemployment it rose from 3.4 percent to 3.7 percent and then it fell back down so you're still at very low levels but that's that's one of those things that is kind of one of the last dominoes to fall when you actually do go into a recession number five stock market volatility we're certainly starting to see that the inverted yield curve this is something i talk about all of the time and if you look at the 10 year and three month yield curve this thing has been inverted since october of 2022 back during the lows of our markets and this is really the yield curve that everyone watches the two and ten year yield curve is also a big one and this has been inverted since july 5th of 2022 the 10 year and three month yield curve is now inverted 1.35 percent so out of this list from chat gpt of things that happen before or during a recession you're basically seeing all of them in one form or another especially global economic factors it says international economic conditions can also play a role economic troubles in major trading partners can affect a country's exports which can lead to economic slowdowns we've seen this with china look at their exports and imports their imports down 12.4% year over year. Their exports down 14.5% year over year. Basically a straight decline since 2021. So things obviously are not great out there. And in the short term, it could get worse from here. 
considering the markets are forward looking. So if the markets start to perceive higher interest rates for longer, and this does drive up bond yields, at the same time, it looks like the economy is weakening further. And that's how the markets perceive the next couple of months to go. Well, that could be a problem now for our markets. So all in all, when I look at this thing from a 360, 180 kind of point of view, it looks like investors were way too bullish and that does set us up for more room to see declines. And it looks like investors are expecting just a really rosy outcome for the economy. Heading into Fed Jerome Powell tomorrow, expectations could be shattered. With the Fed Rate Monitor tool, this shows you the probability of the Fed's path forward with interest rates. There's currently an 81% chance that the Fed does not raise rates in September. And the markets are actually not expecting another rate increase from the Fed at all. We're expecting the Fed to hold steady from now until May of 2024. May of 2024 is when you're expecting your first 25 basis point rate cut. Just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, markets were expecting this in March. Two months ago, markets were expecting this in November. Three months ago, markets were expecting this in December. So you guys hopefully understand where I'm going with this. The markets keep pushing this out, your first rate cuts, and the markets have basically only went up over the last three months. So at, this, at the same time the markets have been rising, the rate cuts have been getting pushed out. If Fed Jerome Powell really solidifies that stance and maybe freaks out the bond market tomorrow, we could have a big problem. Odds are, in my personal opinion, this 2.5% drop with the NASDAQ we've seen today probably sets us up for pretty bad news from Fed Jerome Powell without another 2% drop. I think it would have to be something quite unexpected from Powell to get another big decline. Not to say that couldn't happen. I just wouldn't hold my hat on it. But... We've seen crazier things happen in our markets. So that is going to do it for this video. If you learned something, you like my perspective, you want to make more money as well as stay up to date with everything happening with Tesla stock every single day or things that could affect Tesla or your portfolios, hit that subscribe button, like the video, as well as comment down below in the meantime. Thank you for watching. My name is Michael Tyler, and I will see you in the next one.